Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly. And that includes me, which, heck, if you don't want to interact with me, I don't know what's wrong with you. So... If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as our other podcasts, other videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am very, very honored to be speaking with Cherish Amber. Hi, Cherish. Hello. Hello. So Cherish is a queer sex, love, and relationship coach. Not to mention hostess of the podcast Coming Out Stronger, which is a great podcast, by the way. I've heard a couple episodes. It's fun times. Thank you. Um, I pulled this from your, from your website that you guide individuals and couples toward their most confident and lovable selves. And I love that thought. And so I wanted to, that was why I wanted to talk to you. Mm. Um, you know, let me, get this, let me get this thought out of the way. Every time I think of sex coach, I think of like some guy in a striped shirt bumps through the door or something like that, has the whistle and goes, sorry, flatulence, that's a foul. Here's your red card. <laughs> I love that. It's bring in the second stringer, you know, Great, finish, yeah. get this, get this job done. Yeah. Clearly that's untrue, but, yeah. um, but let's not start there now that I've ruined the entire episode with a crap joke. <laughs> I think it's spot on. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> are you? I take it. I'd, I'd love to see that. Love to see that striped shirt guy yeah. comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about you first because it, it sounds like your ability to do the, to do the coaching comes from, d d is derived from your own journey toward authenticity. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely say that. Can you take me, can you take me way back? I mean, what was this journey to authenticity? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I don't necessarily know if I can go, oh, it definitely started X amount of years ago. I very much realized as I was getting older, um, actually, I can take you a little bit further back. I'm really lucky <laughs> okay. in the sense, I was like, um, I could take it really, you know, back in terms of I was meant to go to university um, or college and the course got cancelled. And I think that was divine intervention showing me that actually I wasn't meant to be going. And I went into hospitality. And by the time I was 25, I was managing five star, four star sort of 70 bedroom hotels. Oh my hotels. gosh. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what you realize managing teams of 160 people at a time is that you have to be authentic because actually I often pride myself on the fact I would never ask anyone to do a job that I wouldn't do myself. So I would yes. be wiping down tables at one o'clock in the morning, polishing glasses after a wedding, if that's what it meant. And during that kind of coming towards managing hotels, I was wedding planning. I was doing some wedding planning. I love that job. I love events. And I pride myself on my ability to create relationships um, and create really authentic relationships, actually. And what I realized really early on is that um, authentic relationships only happen if you're authentic. Because... Okay. We all live in a world where we know, I think, for the most part, what fakery looks and feels like. Um, I, I wonder. I know what you, you mean, but you go. Well, it's, I've just, you don't have to look very far. All you have to do is go to social media and go, are these real people or are these? Because you hear that okay. Facebook lives, right? I, I'm trying to I think that's the way we put it to you. Know, the yeah. people who show, hey, look, look how happy I am. And then the next week they go. Yeah, I divorced that bastard of a husband, and and people are like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I thought you had a great relationship, and like, eh, it's face Facebook life. Yeah, so. but I think like I think probably this was what probably fourteen, fifteen years ago, and that I don't okay. necessarily know if social media had like massively kicked off at this point. It's a good point. Good point. And and I think, but actually, I was having all of these meetings in person, and I think if you're kind of gifting over the biggest day of your life, right. 
right to someone you want to know that they're going to hold you and support you through that like it's a big thing it's a massive financial situation and I think that was the beginning of me understanding that turning up authentically in my life was the means to having better relationships I love people like I love meeting people I love getting to know people and obviously I'd say, you know, sometimes I can be a little bit discerning because I meet a lot of people now, but actually I love meeting new people. And I made a commitment to myself the first time I went to Australia that I was going to learn something new from every single person I ever met for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. And... And I think that I am pretty, uh, like, I, I honor that 20-year-old version of me because I think I've probably done that. Um, and my friend says, um, take what you want and leave the rest um, when you kind of have interactions with people. And actually, I, I, I think I live by that, you know, a, mm. aside from my coaching interactions, because obviously that's all about relationship and building yummy, you know, yummy interactions with someone. Yeah. What what surprises me that you you mentioned that authenticity you were you were managing teams of 160 I think is what you said mm-hmm. which like you you came up with with the um, what I think is one of the most important lessons to learn as a manager which is to be authentic because what, you're able to portray like why you're doing what you're doing and you can get people excited about it and people who are excited about something that you're excited about will follow you. Absolutely. And so it's interesting that in your tw- in your 20s you would come up with this very very fundamental tenet of uh, of management that like people today, you know, in their 50s, 60s still haven't gotten. I mean, that's mm. why would you why would you go on to do relationships as opposed to maybe management consulting? Cause mm. it sounds like you would have been just as successful. Thank you. Um, I'll be really honest and say like, I love sex. I have <laughs> loved sex since I was younger, you know, since oh, sure. I was 16. Um, you know, that's, that's the age of consent in the UK and, you know, it, developing and fostering and before that kissing girls and like just having super yummy interactions. So, um, I had a bit of an epiphany, if I'm honest, this is, this is how I became a coach. I had a bit of an epiphany one day and I, and I know that sounds a bit, a bit random, but a thought dropped into my head and that said that if people are identify as girls or, um, anyone that identifies with, with the female gender, um, if they were able to understand their own pleasure growing up, and understand yes and no, that maybe things like um, interrelationship rape or rape and sexual assault might happen less. Mm. Mm. And what I realized very quickly, that was the epiphany. I want to be really clear. That was the thought. What has transpired since was the realization that everybody, every single human that exists on this planet should know their own pleasure before they start yeah. interacting with other people. Oh gosh. So tall order. I know. And I'm not saying should, I hate the word should, but I'm, what I'm thinking is like that if they could, then they may be able to understand consent and be able to say yes or no more because they know what they're feeling because they've explored it already. Right. Right. Cause you, on, I read on your website or in your profile, um, the, the the relationship between self-discovery and empowerment. Yeah. And this is what you're talking about. I mean, I had actually talked about management, people following you, yeah. but you, but self-discovery also builds new leaders. Yeah. People yeah. people who can lead themselves. So Absolutely. I mean, tell tell me more. What's what's the relationship then between self-discovery and acceptance and empowerment? So my journey to self discovery specifically was the realization that I am a product of other people's trauma. Mm. Mm. And I know that's a massive statement, but when I, we are as humans, we are the only people that can love ourselves unconditionally. Uh, People may that that's kind of a bit of a hill I'm willing to die on. We are the only people, 
we expect our parents to, they can't because they are also a product of the trauma that, you know, that they experienced. And so when I was able to realize that and realize that I didn't choose my path, I didn't choose what happened to me at, you know, formative years. I didn't choose to be gay. It's me. It's inherently me. I was able to be so much more gentle with myself. And I think that for me is the beginning of self-discovery. It's when you are able to be gentle with yourself exactly as you are without needing to change yourself, without needing to say, yeah, but X, Y, and Z, I should be meditating. I should be, you know, going to the gym five times a week. I should be getting a coach therapy, whatever. I should be getting a better job. If you remove the shoulds from your life, you're able to have your own sense of self, deep love for yourself. And that's what fosters empowerment and able to stand in your truth. What is it about the acceptance that that allows you to move forward? I'm I'm using I'm thinking of the word empowerment as moving forward. Am I okay. am I using misusing that? Yeah. Or? No, like empowerment, like moving forward, or just you know being able to speak your truth. I feel like someone who's empowered is able to speak their truth. Okay, okay. You know, and someone who's not a you know who who's able to hold gently the opinions of others would be an interesting sure. way to think about it. And I mean that really gent like really I'm being really soft here, like able to hold gently what they hear from other people because sometimes, especially in the LGBTQIA plus community, what we hear from others is horrific. Yes. So yes. so you asked me where acceptance moved through to an empowerment, is that right? Yeah. Yes. That's right so yeah so if we come back to what i originally said and said the only person we're able to that's unable to love ourselves unconditionally is us then we're able to hold more gently what other people say to us because we know deep down in our core that we're good enough that we are lovable that we are worthy of being here that we're meant to be on the planet okay that our that our positioning in society regardless of how you identify is worthy all right. And I that think that sense. comes from that comes from self discovery. Yeah, yeah. Have you have you studied much uh, existential philosophy, uh, psychology? A little bit. Um, one of my favorite books in the world is Ex- Existential Kink, which isn't necessarily. It follows a little bit of that. It's not actually a kink book, if you can believe it. Um, I, it's more shadow based work. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, not as much perhaps as I'd like. There's because th- there's a psychologist, existential existential psychologist named Rollo May, mm-hmm. who has has said something similar to to or at least his clinical um, findings. I think lend credence to what you're saying that as we as we learn to see ourselves and, and say, well, this is where I am at the moment. It's it's a way of accepting that other people are just where they are at that moment, and so you feel better about yourself and the world's happier you know, you, you can let the world be as it is as well. And so that's exceptional. I'm glad that, uh, and so you bring this forth in your work. I mean, this is part of the, the coaching process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's, that's why, as you mentioned on my website, it's like, how can we have the best sex, love and relationships? And I want to be, I just want to comment. I have started to use the term like, um, love and intimacy interchangeably. So like, I feel like it's really important to say sex, intimacy and relationships, sex, love and relationships. Like for me, they form a part of our identity, right? Like, and that's yes. so a thing. So that's why my coaching, that's why I've described that the way I have is because for me, for us to feel the deepest, the depth of pleasure that's possible to us as human beings starts with our ability to, to meet ourselves exactly where we are in this moment and not want to change it because it's, we live in a society that's always like trying to better us. Like self-help is such a massive topic right now. And actually we grow a lot of self-hatred in that. Um, And that's just not, it's not supportive of development. It's the opposite, has the opposite effect. So finding yourself, meeting yourself where you're at. And actually, if we were to like open that up to relationships, even meeting the other person where they're at right in that moment is so powerful because we finally feel seen. 
And I guess I would give you an example, yeah. if, it's, if it's okay, I didn't mean to button, I'm sorry. Please. No, please. It's like, how many times have you been in an interaction with someone where you've wanted, you know, you've gone in and you're going, this is so hard, I'm so struggling with this. And they have come at you with five shoulds. You should just, you should just, you should just. And you leave the interaction feeling um, empty. Like, mm -hmm. whereas... When you enter into a situation where you're like, this has just happened and I feel this and someone goes, that sounds really crap. I'm so sorry that's happened to you. Are you okay? You just feel full. You feel fuller. Yes. You feel sated. Yeah. You feel like you've had a big meal. And I think that's a really good example of what it means to be met just where you're at every time. I get that. I like that. I have, there was a thought in the back of my head as you've been talking through this. If sex, love, and relationships are are related, because you said they were sort of rolled up in a ball. I, I don't mm. remember how you put it. But yeah, yeah. What do you think about uh, people who are aromantic or, or uh, aromantic versus like demisexual? Yeah. What's... And 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 ace and and asexuals and and you know yes. um yeah so I I feel like from my from my interactions with aces I feel like that's that you know a lot of the asexual people that I know happy with the term aces so I'll use aces a little bit interchangeably with asexuals and it feels important to say that because of safety within your listenership yeah. yeah um for me like the relationships are also a part of that. They are all joined up together for someone who's not an ace or doesn't identify with asexual or, or you know, even agender. Um, so, but we all have relationships, right? We all have relationships and, and interactions with people. It doesn't always involve sex and that's also okay. okay. And how we interact with people in our lives, you know, I, a, a lot of people that identify as asexual that I've worked with or have had interactions with have beautiful, fulfilling relationships. They just don't have sex. Okay. Does that make sense? It, so it's like, it does. Well, what about, so, so aromantic though, is somebody, I, I, this is not being aromantic, being on the, the opposite spectrum. I tend to be demisexual. I tend to sure. be like, if I don't connect with you, like sex just isn't going to happen. There's no, I will have no interest. Absolutely. But I can see, or at least I have heard of aromantic people who are like, yeah, I really, there's nothing. I'm never going to have a, a, a closed relationship with somebody, a caring relationship. So what's the point? Let's just have mm. sex. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, to me, the, to me, the idea that sex, love and relationship are, are intertwined makes sense, but I, there are, there are people who do, who don't. Mm, um, beautiful. Yeah. So like a romantic would be the, fr and I guess actually asexual as you brought up as well. So I don't know. Well, do you, do you find a, people who come to you and go, well, look, I have no relationship, but I want sex. And you go, eh, can't help you. Or no, no, not at all. Cause I like, I, 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 as I said, I love sex myself. I don't specifically <laughs> see myself as a romantic personally, but, um, yeah, I think that, I think for me, I'm able to support people um, on their journey, you know, to having better sex, comma, love or intimacy and relationships and all relationships, you know, like I really hear you on the people okay. that, you know, just identify with uh, as a romantic and, and it's such an exciting journey to be on with them um, uh, to, to kind of explore that. Because I guess for me, my coaching is to have have better like I want to say like mind altering life changing versions of all of those things they don't necessarily have to all be and I'm aware that you're right like my language was they're all kind of combined into one but my term I guess would be like love and intimacy are a bit more interchangeable okay. um so and it's interesting you said about a sex coach being that kind of person who comes in and <laughs> and and I agree and it's so interesting isn't it and I think that's that's you know as with a lot of the things that you specifically you and I are kind of working in with regards to gender sexuality and and sex as a topic separately the language is evolving really quickly society is, yes. is slowly catching up right yes and that's just where we're working with and that's okay um but but for me in terms of the work that I do um I, I want, oh, I hate the term want, like society shuts down people, shuts people's sexuality down left, right and center. Mm -hmm. And I love to support people to have 
beyond their wildest dreams, sex, love, and relationships. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I, I still see them combined. So yes, it totally does. Because if you can relate to somebody closely, I think you can explore yourself more deeply. Yeah. And, and even and if that's a be... one... Yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Finish up. And even if that's a one one night situation, even if that's a one day situation, mm. right? Okay. Like, I've, how I've yummy. Those. Oh, yeah. me too. Yeah, we just you know, it's it's some somebody who you are you are one hundred percent in love with for that entire day, and you wake up the next morning and you go, oh, all right, we'll get the fuck out, and uh, yeah. maybe not quite that yeah. harshly, but I understand that. Okay, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's like then how do we support people to not have that? And I'm not saying you did say this, but like, <laughs> how do we support people to have to not have? any shame the next day not even an ounce of shame like there are lots of people I know that would go through that and be like oh you know maybe I shouldn't have more like no like Mm. you got the most delicious yummy gooey wonderful 24 hours of your life Mm. yes celebrate that why why do we stigmatize that then what I mean I mean I got a good idea I mean obviously you know um, Abrahamic religions are, are not very fond of sex, tend to look down on it to a certain extent. Is that the whole thing? I mean, I, I believe, um, I believe that when women and non-binary folk, and I want to be really clear, women, anyone that identifies with the term woman, full stop end sentence. Thank you. Um, when women and non-binary folk um, are in their power, in their sexual power, having full body orgasm, they are unstoppable. Mm, And I think in a patriarchal society, they don't want it. A a patriarchal society does not want people living in their power going like, because, because we are unstoppable. Do you know what? I, I hear what you're saying. I, because I think there are also, I mean, men, and again, in the, the full stop version that you're saying, anybody identifying as such who are not part of that patriarchy. And I, and I would include all of that, that it's not mm-hmm. even just an orgasmic thing that as we know ourselves, we become unstoppable. And so, and so I agree. I mean, I think you can look at much of what's going on in the news today and, and see, um, you can see a response from our governments that say, you know what, we want to make sure you don't have too much identity because if you know yourself too well, we can't control you as well. Absolutely. I and just I got, think this, I just got chills. This is exactly, <laughs> is exactly right. I think I just got, because I had a question here that says, you know, is consent a part of authenticity? And now I see what you're saying, because when you know who you are, geez, now I'm getting chills. <laughs> when you know who you are, you really, truly can say yes or no. Mm-hmm. Oh, Cherish, that's beautiful. <laughs> and That's really great. Thank you. Like, and that's, that's, what's it, that's what it is. And, and, you know, one of the beautiful things that I got taught in my training was... When a a woman, again, woman full stop, and non-binary folk have an orgasm, have a full body orgasm, they will sweat, mouth open, head back, yelping and howling. I have done this. Right? What other thing do you know that is associated with sweating, mouth open, howling, yowling and screaming? Lunacy. Yep. Yep. Lunacy. Oh. That's the other one. Yep. How interesting oh, is shoot. that? Well... Right? It's not. And that's what I mean. It's like, that's what's so interesting is, okay, so, so then we are told, and the porn industry has got an awful lot to pay for in this. We're told that we're just meant to be this like, oh yes, wonderful, please, whatever. And sit there and take it, which... I have to admit, I have, you know, I've done an, way more times than I would have liked, but mm-hmm. it's like, I know that in that stage of my life, that's what was the right thing. And that's the safest thing for me. And I, sure. and I know differently, but like, you know, 
the patriarchy as a whole, I just want to use that term rather than like gendering it, the patriarchal society that we live in would really like us to not be in our full body power. Agreed. I yeah. wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. I, to, I, I think all humans though. I, it's it's mm-hmm. this huge, right. you know, there's this it's weird, like humans. Yeah, it's this weird, you know, just don't know who you are because if you do, it's it's going to be hard to control you. It's going to be hard to absolutely. you know to do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and I mean, you know, you don't have to go very far back. You could look at you know the the um, I guess you know the psychology and psychiatry of of like Victorian England. Yeah, people who are like, <laughs> well, you're not supposed to have sex, and they're like, but I really want to have sex, and they go, no, 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 no. What that is is just anxiety. Or it's, um, you know, it's a dissociative disorder. It's or something right. else. It's like, no, you just need a good orgasm. Like, right. Literally. That's, you know, yeah. And, and, and it, it's really interesting, isn't it? Even there's lots of um, really interesting, like, um, well, I can't think of the word, like just language, basically. You know, the term hyster- hysterectomy comes from the term hysteria. Oh my gosh, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Huh. It's, so it's like those, you know, to have, you know, someone's womb removed, result of hysteria, like, you know, yeah. and, and it's just, it, there's just so many things. And this isn't, this isn't necessarily, I, I think perhaps... It sounds like I'm being gendered in my language. I'm not. I'm just being like people in their full authenticity, you know, and they're just, we, we're often shut down in it. And, it, and it's not, right. you know, and the, the world that, you know, I think if specifically, you know, if in this conversation, you and I, you know, we want people who are fully alive in their authenticity and mm-hmm. able to show up. And, yeah. and that often looks like having incredible sex. <laughs> Well, For some also... people who identify with uh, identify with <laughs> wanting sex, <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's good to have the disclaimer. Always. But you you had mentioned lunacy and lunacy, obviously you, the coming from Luna, you know, coming from the moon, which was a big feminine symbol. You've got I've got my own lunar symbols. Always. You've got lunar symbols on Always. you. Yeah. So interesting. You know, though I. My opinion, and and this is, I'm going off on a big limb here. I've Good. articulated none of this, so I'm, you know, if this comes out really crazy, I love just it. Stop me, but <laughs> I think the real, like when sex is is so, mm, it's when you have a good integration of the masculine and the feminine, and I think the patriarchy. I think what what we would consider the patriarchy wants to eject the feminine. Mm-hmm. In, in which case, you know, you you do that by subtly saying, well, a hysterectomy, you know, we're removing removing, you know, the womb because of hysteria. And you've gone crazy because of this feminine symbol. Always. And I'm about to cough. <laughs> Go ahead, talk. I, in the, you know, what I find really interesting is that um historically, and this is not generalized because there are definitely moments we can pull out and I could give you some names historically women that have been successful in business have Mm. personified more of a traditionally masculine you know energy like maybe with how they dress maybe how with things and there are there are moments like Ellen Michelle Obama Oprah there are people that don't but if we look at the people for instance I, I don't know I think you've got we've got Dragon's Den over here your I'm it's sorry, called something else like over there it's okay. um it's called, it's called something different over there it's where you basically go and pitch to like six investors it's a tv show oh, uh shark tank yes shark tank, yeah, you call it some, yeah yeah um you know all i always see the investors on there they have more of this you know the, the female investors have more of this masculine vibe and it's just super right. interesting right. it's like right. so if you're growing up you know and uh, and maybe a, this is a much bigger topic. I was talking about this with a friend the other day. If you're growing up and you're seeing people like that, you're like, well, like, do I ha- do I have to personify more of this quote unquote more traditional masculine energy to be successful? Well, the a- answer is absolutely not. But it's just it's just and it's it's that like you know, there's so many of us trying to really push against what society is telling us we have to conform to, and it's mm-hmm. really interesting. Oh, sure. No, I think that plays a huge part in my own story, wanting to, 
wanting to portray femininity, Mm -hmm. but realizing that, I mean, not only were there social expectations that, you know, having been assigned male at birth, Mm -hmm. I should be masculine. That was also the way that I found I made the most money. You know, if I, if I would go and be, you know, more of an alpha male kind of person, Mm -hmm. I could be more successful. I could rise in the ranks when I was more of a nurturing type manager, because we had talked about management before, Mm. you know, one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned is that, you know, being a good leader means like empathizing with the people you're trying to follow. Because if you can empathize with them, it generally gets reciprocated. Then you go, gosh, we have like this group uh, motivation group. I don't know what the word I want to use is, but you you Mm -hmm. go, look, now we can have a direction. Nobody, no manager above me, always men, (laughs) of course, no manager above me thought that was was valuable, viable Mm -hmm. even. It was just like, what are you doing? You, You crack a whip. Don't be a pussy. Don't be a girl. And it's like, but I'm getting results and you're a dick. <laughs> so right. and, uh, I, and I, I went off on a tangent. And, Sorry. No, no, it's great. No. And I think what's interesting and, and like, yeah, and I'm ha- happy to come back. But I think what's interesting is I always was always taught like a, um, a good a, a, a manager is the person in the chariot whipping the horses. And the good leader is the person at the front pulling the carriage at the, from the very front. Mm. And I just, yes. and I think when you look at the, and this isn't, this isn't generalized, but when you look at like business owners or founders that have done well, I think they often have that. So say what you like about him. I always think Richard Branson is mm. one of those that kind of okay. like funny. I, I just, he's, he's very British, but <laughs> yes, he's very British. More of that. But like, I always think that he's probably, yeah, one of them. I, I love his story. It's, you know, one of those kind of slightly like, you know, what? I'm going to lead from the front. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to, you know, right. he, he tried to bring out virgin condoms called virgin condoms. And oh. he literally got to print before someone went, Richard, I really, I really think that you should not yeah it's right you know and it's just like and it's there's just you know when you when you you're right like the people who've done really well in this world are the people that have no the people who the people think have done really well in this world are often the people who have the most empathy the most down-to-earthness you know right right i don't think elon musk is liked by many people oh god no (laughs) right um he he so embodies that I'm going to step on anything. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. hurt anybody because this is mm-hmm. what it takes to be successful. And I disagree. Agreed. So, Agreed. Absolutely. I agree. I, you called me out on, on the distinction between management and leadership and I completely agree. I, I always have in my head that a manager should be a leader because otherwise, why did you go into it? Mm. Like what, why, what would, what would be your purpose for wanting to be in charge if not to lead? Mm. But I, you know, probably I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure I have a number. I would probably guess eight out of 10 of the people I have seen as managers don't want to be leaders. They want to be in charge. I think Elon mm-hmm. Musk is a fabulous, uh, you know, example of that. So mm-hmm. exactly. That went very far afield. The, the idea of um, the idea of masculinity and femininity, though, I feel that um, in our community, so, so in the LGBTQ community, I think we have the tendency to, you know, obviously we 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 go against social norms. I'm just gonna leave it at that. How about if we, just, we go right. against social norms? Do you had mentioned? we were products of trauma as well earlier on in the, in, in your discussion. Do, do you find that members of our community tend to be, um, tend to have greater aspects of trauma, different, different types, more entrenched, I think is the words I want to use just because Mm. Mm. we have a tendency to buck social norms. What comes when you immediately ask is, First and foremost, that we're actually more aware of it rather yes. than it being 
hidden in the depths and it being someone's way of going without them realizing it. I think the trauma that we experience is palpable. It's yes. visible, it's visceral, we can feel it, we can see it. You know, right. um, I talk, one of the things that every single one of my guests has said on my podcast is the thing about coming out is you are always coming out. Yeah, yes. So that's that's the thing is like we're experiencing trauma all the time. So it's So we're able to, for want of a better word, we're able to process it a little bit quicker. The answer is absolutely yes, we do, because it wasn't okay for us to be ourselves. Right, right. But I, and so the way that, you know, I manage that in a different way is, it, you know, safety, safety is absolutely the f- cornerstone, the, f- the first thing within my business as a whole, within my coaching practice, and the way that I live my life. So creating safety for every body, separate words everybody that's the forefront and I think that's how we can overcome it but in answer to your question I think yes and it's much more at the surface it's we're much more aware of it yeah we, yeah yeah I agree with that I agree with that um because I think you can look at lots of people in society supposedly cishet and you just go mm, you sure about that right dig a little right. deeper and maybe you'll find exactly. something but yeah. yeah and i and i think it's you know testament to people who are out and there's no you know on anyone that's not out people who's out testament to their ability to be authentic and yeah. able to their to speak their truth and stand in their identity whatever that identity is right um and it, i think that shows a real a deeper understanding of themselves um than it does of people that perhaps uh, identify as cishet or perhaps aren't out or that kind of thing right um less so not being out but more so identifying as cishet um i i I think that's what's interesting is is a it's a better understanding of themselves which shows a better understanding of the trauma they've experienced during their lives yeah Yeah. and and as a result i and this is a guess i'm asking you more yeah is it because and and that's why we can feel it more keenly why it cuts more deeply yeah and and yeah so you know it's that when we know ourselves we know what our triggers are and we're able to be and i often it's really interesting i i've got this horrible analogy which i don't even like saying out loud but (laughs) because it's a little bit a little bit grotesque but um, I often think about trauma as like, um, like a wound. And, um, if you imagine someone with, if they fall over, I'm going to use my arm, if they fall over and there's a wound here. There's a scab on top, keeping mm-hmm. it safe. Right. Um, it's quite easy to kind of almost forget it's there, but it, it's still very much there and it's sure. not very nice underneath and it's making us maybe not use our arm in the same way it's making us do something differently right the second that we start to do the work do the work on trauma or do the work on whatever it is and we knock the scab off yeah that's the gross bit i'm sorry it's a bit gross and what i loved it (laughs) what coaching therapy self-work self-development work does is it starts to be the balm to the wound i see but what in answer to your question it's still an o- very open wound <laughs> so right. a little little moments of you know discrimination in whatever way whatever it is or you know horrible behavior it's a little bit a little bit of like vinegar or lemon juice in that wound like it feels yeah. more painful yeah. but what we're able to do slowly but surely when we're doing the work and receiving whatever it is you're using as your betterment tool is heal the wound from the inside out make it grow up and out rather than be right. this not very nice thing that's festering right what what are those tools you you say whatever tool your your betterment tool what what are the tools that you use so specifically in my coaching i pull on um so i use something called parts work um which is um a really beautiful piece of work that understands that we all have different parts to us 
So a really obvious one is inner child. A lot of people know sure. a kind of sure. inner child work. Um, and when we're able to meet those parts of ourselves and give them a voice, literally, that's what we do in the coaching sometimes, is give this part of us a voice, we're able to integrate it because for the first sure. time often it's being heard. Um, the other time of that is shadow within the kind of interlinked is shadow work. Um, and I want to be really gentle and, and offer like this to be really gentle. You won't always necessarily know what I'm using because it's not like today we're going to do shadow work. Um, it's kind of like just getting really curious with our internal world um it's getting really curious with our what what i call or what is kind of collectively called the body mind okay so it's um it's it's getting curious with the parts of us that are talking so if i was to say i can do a really easy exercise in the moment but if i was to say you know like where in your body right now do you feel a little bit of discomfort like maybe my left hip okay cool so why don't we just get in like really inquisitive with that left hip why don't we like tell me more about it has it got a color like has it got a sensation oh it's red it's black it's whatever okay cool how would it be to like speak as this bit of your hip how would that be like let's get curious like let's just be really gentle with it and that's that's parts work like that's kind of speaking as this part of you okay okay so Um, this is different from internal family systems because yeah, that was but, what I thought initially. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So that's this parts work. Um, so um, forgive me. I just want to be really clear and get the name of the person who created parts work because my memory on these kind of things sometimes fails me and I want to be really like honor okay. them so, um, so, so not richard, richard schwartz then oh it is yeah, richard, exactly. schwartz. Oh, okay. it is richard schwartz yeah i just right. i'm really bad at remembering stuff so that he is, does that internal is internal that's sound. ifs yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he does yeah. ifs but parts work is speaking as this part of us not yeah not okay. it being a different part yeah and and that's what's interesting and that's what's challenging about my coaching is i'm trained as, as a vita coach and Layla martin who created vita um is trained in a multitude of things including sure. um going to stanford university doing sexology biology and um in microbiology as well as 15 years learning the tantric tradition okay so she pulls on loads of things so i feel really lucky that i'm trained in like lightly in lots of different things and that's a very specific methodology so um that would be so richard schwartz's um book no bad parts is a really great place to start yeah. with past yes. work okay so um i've got that one upstairs by the way it's very good um and then oh, it's such a good book i love that book um and then the other piece is tantra so um tantra has got a little bit of a reputation as it does <laughs> yeah only as sex which it is not but, exactly. So, so j- just so you know, my I, at least at one point, identified myself as a Shakta Tantrika. So, oh, God is so God, yeah. So, so I'm well familiar with Tantra as a as a darshana, as opposed to a uh, you know just like a sex tradition. So, amazing. The idea of using the world to understand the world, as opposed to yeah. you know assuming a, a dualistic uh, nature to the universe. I'm done. You finish up. Sorry. No, that's okay. No, so there's like, so for anyone that's listening, the understanding of Tantra as a left-handed, a left hand of Tantra is if there's God in the orgasm and or goddess or source or universe or higher wisdom, if there's, if there's higher power in the orgasm, there's also higher power in the vomit and the, and the spit and the feces. And yes. And the feces. Right. Right. Dead bodies. Um, yeah. Exactly. And it's like, how, so how can we transmit that into how we experience stuff? It's like the, the only way out is through. So we have to kind of feel the ick, feel the bad parts, yeah. feel the parts of us we might not like very much, yeah. give it a voice and allow it to transmit through and transmute into something much more delicious and yummy. Um, uh, in terms of coming back to your question around my coaching practice, I also, um, whilst I'm not trained, I have weekly therapy and me and my therapist have got an amazing relationship and often I'll like use little tools and tricks that he's brought me, which I've got with his permission. Um, I'm also, um, 
you know, and, and doing an awful lot of further learning. And I'm aiming to do a master's in trauma. So oh, I gosh. bring in different bits of trauma work because I'm fascinated yeah. by trauma. So um, the body keeps the score work, sure. um, of course. And, um, and then also a lot of the reading that I did within my course, which is around like a book called Wired for Love and things like the couple bubble and relationship work and that kind of thing, um, along with some really deep powerful practices that my clients do at home that aren't done through the coaching practice which is a vault it involves self-touch self-pleasure mm. um self-practices one-to-ones one to two you know within their relationship in um whatever capacity that looks like so it's like a big collective of lots of different practices and i feel really lucky to be uh, to pull on lots of different things no it sounds amazing especially Gosh, you said so much that I want to follow up on. Um, the idea, <clears throat> the idea of trauma is so multifaceted, mm. presumably, which is why you wanted to, to continue education mm. um, in that. But <sighs> the other thing I wanted to bring back up was the idea that we have to come out all the time, which is which is one hundred percent true. I mean, I went to go get a just like a vaccine because I'm going to be going to, uh, to Thailand for, for, um, my gender affirming surgery, by the way. So look at that. Well, yay! yeah, only going to Thailand because my insurance claim was denied. So Ugh, fuck's sake. thank you. Sorry. Thank sorry. you. Sorry. US, <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks. U S health service. But anyway, or U S healthcare. Um, but, but I mean, I had to get a vaccine and, and it said, you know, sex assigned at birth was a was a, a question on it and i brought it up to the person unfortunately the person was very i don't know I, i'm trying to think of what i would call her it was obviously very accepting because i said listen i'm kind of offended by this question and she looks just looked at it and she goes oh yeah that's conservative rhetoric you know embodied in a form and i said does it does it make a difference with dosage no does it make a difference with handling no does it make a difference with aftercare no she says there is literally nothing. We it's just on there because it's conservative rhetoric embodied in a form. And I went, wait, honestly, not no nothing. She goes, no nothing. I'm going to give you a mm. shot. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to know this? No reason. Mm -hmm. And I went, mm -hmm. oh damn. But it was a forced outing right there. You know, every time I I try to do something, you know, it's like change a name or something like that. That's like I should be able to do this through a website, right? No, you have to call somebody and they go, how'd you get this different name? And you go, okay, well, forced outing. Um, I'm telling any of these stories to say that uh, trauma, you know, plays a huge role in, in our entire lives. I actually feel trauma is also a very useful tool for any social environment because you seek to avoid that trauma. And so you can, mm -hmm. you can reinforce social roles. And mm -hmm. I don't want to use the word trauma, really social norm is the thing. But if you go against a social norm, mm -hmm. that experience is typically traumatic. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop talking for a moment. But uh, what do you think on any of that with having to do with trauma? Yeah, I think you're so right, you know, and it's like, as we slowly start to you know, support society to change its understanding and the way that it's, um, you know, views the world and and how it views, you know, my, you know, my group, minority group, sorry, like understanding that their words can cause trauma, literal trauma, yeah. exactly like you just said, that was such a good example is like, you know, forced outing, not and completely unconsenting, you know, right. causes trauma. And if we were to track that back in terms of what we talked about consent a little bit and consent is a bit of my passion project as always, but specifically I'm working on some, you know, piece of work around this right now. It's like, it's completely unconsenting. It's like, and every single time we go against our, yeses our full body yeses we experience a little bit of trauma and mm. and there's there's no such thing as little bits of trauma but like it's kind of tra tra we talk about it in 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 coaching terms as like trauma with a uh, lowercase c t or an uppercase t 
like oh. uh, capitalize right sure it's like um and it you know so that's kind of a way to think about it it's like we're when when we're constantly you know not allowed to listen to our body cues and go against our will and say things that we're not consenting to which is what sometimes we have to do to to keep our own safety we have to sometimes traumatize ourselves and it's just this very yeah. funny situation in society right now it's really quite scary and it's yeah and it's, and and it's hard isn't it because i just gave voice to society is changing and yet it's not been this unsafe to be a member of the lgbtqia best community in a long time so we're in this funny space right now where it's like you know what you just said you know and i want to give voice to what i said earlier is like i had uh, i felt it was very important to create safety by saying when i said woman because I'm a cisgendered woman, I need to state that my terminology is the use of anyone that identifies with the term woman, sure, full stop. Sure. But that's something that I need to do to create safety. And I hope society is slowly a little bit getting there a little bit more. We are seeing changes um, because that ensures that nobody listening doesn't think that I only assume that you know a woman is someone who is cisgendered. Right. Does that make sense? And it's it like- does very it's much, a, yeah it's where we're at it's like how you know how can we support people to not be experiencing these little moments little jabs little like pinpricks all the time or big pinpricks right (laughs) right (laughs) you know you had brought up um language before the the idea especially with the 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 shifting language within even our own community is Mm -hmm. the problem how do i want to formulate this question is the problem largely linguistic No, but I think language has a huge part to play in acceptance right now. I think that, you know, for instance, non-binary being, and well, the use of they, them pronouns being a really large reason that people won't accept non-binary folk because technically it's not grammatically correct. Sure. I mean, according to some monk, you know, 400 years ago, which do we give a damn or... No, we don't. And I think that's where I think language is is incredibly limiting. You know, I often talk about the fact that to my understanding, the Thai language has five gender genders, like f- I don't know. words for gender. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. Um, you know, and even, um, you know, the First Nations of America and, you know, of North America have the term two spirit. Right. right like, right. The, the English language is actually incredibly restrictive when it yes. comes to how we describe certain things. And I think people use that as a way to, to get round and be homophobic or transphobic or anything phobic real, realistically. And I think that's where it's really interesting right now. So whilst I don't think it's solely on language, it does have a huge part to play. Because, for instance, you know, if you were to see the term, I think a lot of people are using the term um, God X as a term for anyone that identifies with the term goddess, you know, but goddess has historically been a female term. Or, for instance, um, if I was to write down to you W-A-W-O-M, X N, you would understand the terminology, but I can't say that. I can't, I, I can't vo- vocalize that word because it doesn't. It, does that make sense? It, it does. Yeah. Keep and, going. And so, what I often say to a lot of people when I'm supporting people in my privileged lived experience as a cisgendered white woman I often find myself being a safe vessel for people to ask questions to around the LGBTQ plus community yeah and what I often say to people is I invite you to increase the amount of words that you're using we have spent a long time sorry is it like we've spent a long time minimizing the words that we use like less 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 get really really to the point and now we're in a space where we have to increase dramatically right so so i would never say the term ladies and gentlemen i would say um if i if i was there i would, I would probably say 
beautiful humans or wonderful humans or humans but if I was you know I would we would always use the term ladies gentlemen gender non-conforming folk um and you know and people who don't I you know whatever the next part is there's more words right. to come and that's important right so I think that's where the language that's the language piece I, I like that um you know I, I there's Judith Butler obviously with their their work even going back to 1991 mm -hmm. the idea that the gender is a social construct mm -hmm. has is is very easily used against is very easily used against the queer community because you can just mm -hmm. go well if it's if if it's a social construct and it, and use of the term defines it i just use woman to mean somebody with you know these parts i i use woman to to imply somebody who is assigned female at birth yeah i'm looking at you jk rowling mm -hmm. but uh um, so i mean it's it's almost like that's harmed as much as helped the idea that you know if language is fluid then we have no way to get out of it really because you you can have people who say, well, I use the word this way, and people who say, well, I use the word this way, and just go, eh, social constructs, suck it up. So I like, and I have a really good example of this, right? So this isn't this is again, this is my lived experience as as pers personally, but I use the term, and I think you will have seen it written in most places. I use the term I identify as a queer gay lesbian, as queer gay lesbian. Okay. And I'm very specific about that because I live in a community society that still identifies queer as the as a negative term. Yes, right. Um, so that's specific. Is like, so I feel it's important in terms of my identity to say that I identify as gay. I identify as queer. And to the queer community, I'm a member of the queer community. Like, I am queer. Like, and when we're in that space, I would only ever say I'm queer. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but when I'm elsewhere, I will say, no, I'm gay. I identify, you know, I'm a lesbian. Because it immediately places me where they need me to be placed in their minds sure sure does that make sense and i think that's a really good example of language and how quickly it's changing and and, and how unfortunately social constructs like we have to fit ourselves in but not and it's just a horrible thing right well and and you know we could go off on a really big tangent here i mean you know the danger i think of of assigning identity to a, a socially defined term but yeah, that's that's really sort of the basis of what it is that I do that, you know, and which is which yeah. is why we probably don't want to get into it, because then we'll be <laughs> going for another hour. But because um, it's funny when you said queer, gay, lesbian, I see those as three different definitions. Gay mm. to me means a man. It's, True. It's an, yeah, an, I hear you. And, and so, so it's, I, I like, it's yeah. odd. Yeah. Uh, like I think I think for for me yeah that's interesting isn't it I think for me that definitely the I think the reason is I think the term gay for other people that I know within the queer community has become a more collective terminology and I think the um the the piece that someone brought to me and I always, I've always had a little bit of funny interactions with the term lesbian, but for me, it's like, it's very strange how you are a lesbian, but you're not a gay. <laughs> um, like it's a, it's a That's noun a for some reason. Yeah. It's a yeah. noun instead of an adjective. What the. Exactly. Hmm. So that's why for me, I use probably interchangeably for the most part, but I, oh, I identify as all three because like I'm a gay woman yeah. like, and I don't, don't need anyone else to really know about that. And also, although the term lesbian is, um, is being more encompassed by the non-binary um, community or non-binary folk, I also feel like it's important to like make that distinguish, you know, is I'm a gay woman who, yeah, I'm a gay woman. Yeah. Does that make sense? I I had not considered that. That's a good point. The the how those how those two words are different, but I mean mm -hmm. the history the history of our community is kind of weird, right? I mean the like the big uprisings were were gay men, right? Mm -hmm. I mean started by started not necessarily by gay men, but but you know pushed forward or at least the most uh, prominent. How mm -hmm. about if I say that? Yeah, uh, uprisings, but then also 
AIDS was a was a gay man disease, right? In the eighties. I mean, obviously untrue, but you know, portrayed as a gay man disease. So, I don't know. Lesbians have always been sort of. It, it, it's like the it's like the 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 weird younger sister that you just kind of go, ah, you know, don't come along, you know, Carrie. I don't I don't want you to come along, Carrie, or something like that. And you go off and do your own thing. Mm-hmm. But I think the transgender community is the same because there's such a weird mix between, you know, gay and, and drag and transgender. And it's, I, yeah, yeah, all the language is changing so rapidly that, that, mm-hmm. uh, and I still, to this day, I used the word queer and I was rather proud of myself because I remember that being an absolutely horribly derogatory, what a slur, punch in the face kind of word, you know, assuming you get punched in the face by some, which I never mm. did, but Mm-hmm. but a horrible slur. And so mm. I appreciate some of these reclamations of the words. Absolutely. And I don't know. It's such a, such a strange, such a strange thought, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm looking at time We're we're running low on it. Um, sure. can you, can you tell all the listeners how to find you? I will have notes. Uh, yeah. We'll have links in the show notes yeah. But uh, please, please tell everybody how we can find Cherish Amber. Yeah, of course. So I am the Cherish Amber on Instagram. Um, my website is cherishamber.com. Um, and I, uh, my podcast is coming out stronger and it is available on, on everything. And it's on my website as well. Um, so yeah, if you would drop me a message, if you want to get in touch, um, I also have the message the host thing on my podcast so you can always chat to me if you see something on there as well um but yeah if anything i've said today is like sparks interest feel free to reach out or send me an email we can book in a chat or a call or whatever works best for you yeah it's awesome thank you so much for talking to me today thank you i've loved our conversation it's been amazing an interesting an interesting note um we're going to be talking again in two days yeah we are i can't wait <laughs> right? to have you on i mean i can't wait thank you yeah it's i i love i love everything that you do it's so it it seems so so right it's the right kind of relationship coaching that i that i think you know our society needs the idea that mm. that you know we can have a relationship with ourselves and that and mm. that's where it begins so absolutely i love that thank so thank you thank you i can't wait to have you on yeah, we're going to end up talking about social constructs again. I'll try to oh, hold back. I think we probably are, yeah. That's <laughs> okay. It's what we're here for, changing the narrative. Let's do right. this. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I will say thank you to everybody listening. I'm Amethyst Herrick. I was here with Cherish Amber, and we were talking about sex, love, relationships, and changing the narrative. Thank you again, Cherish. Thanks. Bye.